Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Kelsey Goforth and I'm Dying with Dignity, Canada's Senior Program Manager. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Nicole Curtis and Samantha Shire. I am thrilled to welcome you today to the first session of Dying with Dignity Canada's online conference, Reflections on Death and Dying. We will be meeting throughout November, uh, breaking in December for the holidays, and then meeting again in January. And we will be presenting a range of topics related to death and dying. If you haven't done so already, um, all sessions and the registration links are available on our website. So we encourage you to uh, sign up there for future sessions. We are putting a link in the chat today for uh, this Thursday session, which will be with author and journalist Sandra Martin. So um, do register for that one that's coming up later this week. We also want to acknowledge that today is World Right to Die Day, an occasion to stand in solidarity with all those who have made this choice. Today, we are grateful for the countries around the world that allow assisted dying and recognize the work that is yet to be done. Before we get started today, I want to acknowledge that while we are meeting virtually, the land Dying with Dignity Canada is on is traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We invite and encourage you to do your own research regarding the various treaties, in particular the land in which you're on today while meeting with us. We are pleased to welcome Chelsea Petal. Chelsea is an end-of-life consultant and death doula serving Victoria, BC, and beyond. Her warmth and professional guidance help individuals, families, and children feel anchored through the uncertainty of a serious diagnosis or the grief of terminal illness. A former health policy analyst and plain language writer, Chelsea has deep knowledge of our healthcare system and available resources. Like many of her clients, Chelsea has been a family caregiver to loved ones with terminal cancer and accompanied her mom through MAID in 2019. Chelsea has an end-of-life doula certificate from Douglas College and is a member of the End-of-Life Doula Association of Canada and um, Death Doula Network BC. She also has a master's degree in education from the University of British Columbia and a certificate in human rights education from Equitas International Centre for Human Rights Education in Montreal. Thank you so much for being with us today, Chelsea. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, what an honor it is to be kicking off this first annual conference with Dying with Dignity. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I also want to start by giving thanks to the Liguangan people uh, on whose traditional territory I am on today. And I want to acknowledge their unwavering role as keepers of this beautiful land that I get to live on as a reminder to continue my efforts to support their leadership and to unlearn Indigenous specific racism. So today, we are here to talk about legacy. I'm just going to share my screen with you. So traditional concepts of legacy have us believe that it is found in our estate, in the physical items of value that we pass on to friends and family after our death, and in the money and property or the financial assets that we will to others. But I've long pondered whether or not these objects, these dollars and assets are an accurate reflection of the richness of someone's life. What about things like family values, your impact on others, being of service? Although these factors are things that are harder to quantify, in my mind, this is what legacy is made of. Legacy is also often thought of as something that we leave behind for our loved ones. But as many of us know, legacy is also about living, because to create a legacy for the future, we have to take action right now. And there's this little quote here by Warren Buffett. He says it so perfectly. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. So today we're going to be reframing legacy. We're going to change it from a noun to a verb and one that is synonymous with intention. 
And I'm going to do this by sharing some learnings and stories from uh, my time accompanying my mom through her death and also sharing some stories about how she lived. My hope is really to inspire you in how you might start living your own legacy right now and just open a window to possibility. So I'd like to introduce you to my mom, Mary. She was someone who lived her life and death with legacy in mind. My mom was a French language educator, a writer and a composer among many other things. Her four great loves were nature, music, language, and her grandchildren. My mom had a very poetic soul as you will see through these stories I'm about to share. And she lived her life with complete intention. One of my mom's chief legacies was out as our family's legacy keeper. Over the years, my mom wove together a tapestry of events, writing, meals and rituals that wove together the shared threads of my family's past, our present and our future. She role modeled for us what it meant to learn from and honor our forebearers. And she also taught us how to pass wisdom down to future generations. So I'm gonna share with you now a few examples of the ways that she created a living legacy that has persisted since her death. So let's start with family heirlooms as legacy. Typically, these are things like jewelry, furniture, artwork, photo albums, um, clothing like wedding dresses. They might also be religious items like menorahs or Bibles, and also items of cultural significance like regalia. And these are things that are passed down from generation to generation. These items can be particularly poignant when they're accompanied by a letter describing their importance, the ways that they were used, and also perhaps the wishes that they carry for the future. I also like to view food as a family heirloom because it holds such visceral sense memories and is such a beautiful, beautiful vehicle for legacy. Um, one example is um, a few years before my mom's death, she created a, a cookbook for my sister with recipes from our Christmas open houses and our special family dinners. You can see that she hand wrote every recipe and then also pasted in pictures from those events where we enjoyed that food together as a really special reminder of the times we shared around the kitchen table. For me, she did something a little bit different. Um, she created a sewing kit with buttons and threads and scissors that my gran had actually used and that were passed down to me. And she sort, stored these sewing uh, pieces in an old cookie tin that we had used as children to put our homemade minced meat tarts in at Christmas. And so whenever I open my sewing kit now, I can almost smell those spices of cloves and cinnamon and the, that candied fruit. A beautiful memory every time I use my sewing kit. Clothes can also be a really evocative piece of legacy, um, but we're often stumped with what to do with them after our loved one dies. We have a closet full and drawers full of these clothes that once belonged to them. And so after my mom's death, we chose some of her favorite pieces, her sweaters and blouses and scarves, and we repurposed them into handmade stuffies, these adorable little collection of owls here. So each grandchild has their own owl and my sister and I also have one each as well. And the best part is that we didn't wash her clothes before we made these stuffies. And so they still smell like her. And there's nothing better than seeing my children, especially when they're feeling sad or lonely, they deliberately seek out these owls and hold them and just inhale their Nana's scent. And it immediately brings them comfort and a sense of connection.
I also want to share um, a different take on family heirlooms. And I'd like to suggest something that belongs to everyone, but that can all be considered a part of a family legacy, and that is nature. When my mom was dying, uh, she really wanted to give a gift uh, to her grandchildren, something um, you know, that would persist, that would always be with them. So she did share more traditional things like jewelry and books, but this was something that they would always have access to was her love of nature. And my mom in particular absolutely adored the night sky. And she spent hours learning the map of the stars so that one day she could teach them to her grandchildren. So before her death, my mom chose a constellation, one for each grandchild. And she dictated to me a short sentence describing why she picked that constellation for each grandchild, what made it special for them and how it reflected their unique qualities. And we also conveyed to my kids what her final message was about these stars. And she wanted them to know that whenever they were feeling sad or even happy or excited, any kind of emotion, that they could raise their gaze to the stars, imagine that they were heading up to that constellation and that she would be waiting there for them, ready to have a chat ready to listen, ready to offer some comfort that they could meet in the stars. So let's talk about relationships as legacy. My mom really was a master at bringing people together, especially intergenerational gatherings where we brought all of the grandkids and the aunties and the uncles all together. And she always had a thoughtful icebreaker or a game to help people get to know each other. And she really loved hosting family reunions. So one year she hosted a party that she called Calling All Cousins. And to help us understand our place in the family tree, she taught us all the difference between first cousins and second cousins and first cousins once removed. Um, I did manage to learn those definitions at the time, but they've since flown from my mind, so please don't quiz me on it in the q and I still find it to be quite complex, despite her best efforts to teach us those relationships. Um, but what my mom really understood about these gatherings was the magic that can happen when we put effort into really getting to know our loved ones. In one of my mom's pieces of writing, she implored us to keep on discovering the people you love as long as you have them. They all have surprising and unknown depths. My mom really was the tie that bound our extended family together, but the efforts that she made to help us form our own bonds is a gift that keeps on giving now that she has died. So when my children were two and five, my mom hosted another family re reunion. This one was at our family graveyard for an event she called the Four Bears Teddy Bear Picnic. So this of course was a pun on the word four bearers. My mom was really big on puns. And she had a knack for making even events about death fun and child friendly. So I always like to say, I really come by being a part of this death carrying profession quite honestly, because I, I learned it from my mom. So on this day, um, she brought four of the kids, teddy bears, her grandkids, teddy bears along to the graveyard and set them up next to the headstones with hats and sunglasses and scarves. And they each had their own little teacup so that they could join in our family picnic as well. So that day, as the family began to arrive, we gathered at the gates to the cemetery, waiting for everyone to show up before we would process together over to our family plots, which were all the way over on the other side of the graveyard. My husband was holding my youngest daughter, who was two at the time. And this was her very first visit to this graveyard. And she was starting to get a bit squirmy as two-year-olds do. Um, I think getting a bit restless waiting for everyone to show up. So my husband decided to just put her down and she took off like a shot. With my husband trailing behind, my two-year-old daughter walked with intention all the way across the graveyard in the most direct 
route possible to the foot of our loved one's graves where she promptly sat down. As you can imagine, all of our jaws dropped open because there was no way that she could have known which of the graves belonged to her family, but something in her knew. People who uh, believe in ancestral, ancestral lineage might say that that knowledge was just inherently in her soul or maybe even somewhere in her DNA. But we followed my daughter and uh, with her gathered around our loved one's graves and we ate raspberries from canes that my gran had planted in the 1960s in her backyard, which are now growing in my backyard. We listened to music and shared stories about our loved ones and we tended to their graves together, teaching my children how to remember and honor their ancestors. My mom is now also buried there. And if you ask my daughter, that, two -year, that little two-year-old that scurried across the graveyard, she will tell you that Nana's graveyard is her absolute favorite place in the world. I think it might have a little bit to do with the fact that she can catch lizards there, but my mom would be so proud knowing that she had a hand in teaching her granddaughter to play with ease and with joy around her grave. So I wanna share or recap a couple of these ideas around legacy and how to create and, and honor it. Uh, the first is to create a family tree or a family map, and absolutely this could be with chosen family as well. Grave gardening and decorating is a really beautiful way to connect with your loved ones and to care for them. Cemetery picnics to honor your forebearers, bring your favorite stuffies and a cup of tea. And then also taking some uh, tree clippings or seeds from fruits or vegetables and planting them. And this is especially important um, when we sell our uh, deceased loved ones properties after their death. Um, so I took these raspberry canes from my grand's backyard when she died. And then I've also since taken bulbs like from daffodils and tulips from my mom's backyard uh, that are now living in mine um, so that we don't have to lose those completely once that property moves out of our family. It's a nice way to maintain that connection. So let's explore words, music, and movies as a part of legacy. So over several decades, my mom created what she called her distillation book. And it contained quotes from philosophers and poets, the majority of which were about death and legacy. In this book, she even picked out the quote that she wanted on her gravestone. And it's by Rabbinandrath Tagore. And it says, death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. One of her instructions after her death was for this book to be passed around to family members. My mom felt this collection of quotes was a manifesto for living, and she wanted it to guide us in how we lived our lives because it expressed the things that were most important to her. One of her favorite quotes in this distillation book was by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it says, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to leave the world a better place, to know even one person has breathed easier, easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. And for my mom, that quote was the very definition of legacy. Sharing your life stories is the legacy that's growing in popularity. Many hospices now have legacy recording programs that are facilitated by volunteers. Capturing your story is something that you can do at any stage of life. And in fact, you may already be doing it by writing in a diary. And I wanna make a little here that 
be sure to create some plans around, around what you want done with those diaries after you die, because there might be some details in there that you don't want certain people getting their hands on. So it can be wise to create some instructions either in your will or just express them informally to your executor or to a close friend who will be able to manage what to do with those diaries after your death. So recording your stories, it can be as simple as writing a letter and as complex as recording your full autobiography. And I also urge you to consider other creative ways to record your stories. If writing is not something that really speaks to you, try things like collaging or creating zines, maybe even scrapbooking to tell your life stories. So over the years, my mom wrote what she called legacy stories. And these were narratives about her own life or about uh, those of our ancestors with information that she had carefully pulled together through her extensive genealogy research. In one of these stories, my mom reminisced about her childhood memories with friends Anne, Rose, and Delore. She described what they had in common, listing their vivid imaginations and kind hearts, an understanding of fairness and justice, and also that none of them were afraid to speak their minds. But where they differed was that Anne, Rose, and Delore all had been orphaned and adopted by loving families. Anne by a lonely spinster and her brother, Rose by her uncle and his many siblings and cousins, and Delore by his godmother. So you may have guessed by now that my mom was describing Anne from Lucy Maud Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables, Rose from Louisa May Alcott's Rose in Bloom and Eight Cousins, and Delore from Dinah Maria Mullock's The Little Lame Prince. Her affection for these characters and the lessons that she learned from them created an indelible mark on her life, one that she wanted to share with me, because to know these books was to know my mom. I now have all of these books, the very ones that she read as a child on my bookshelf, and I've started to create my own little library for my children. My hope is that one day they will read my books and feel like they're uncovering some hidden depth to me in the same way that I did with my mom. The books that we choose to read, the songs that make up the soundtrack of our life, and the movies that anchored our childhood speak volumes about who we are and what's important to us. Some ideas for legacy could include creating your own little library of books that shaped you and creating a top 10 movie list or a playlist that represents who you are and the special moments in your life. Books, songs, and movies have the power to summon memories and also reflect our values, our fears, and our dreams. And I really encourage you to take the time to record why these books and songs and movies are important to you and why they touched you. So by now, I am sure that you can see some key messages or themes emerging from these stories. And one of the most salient ones, and I can almost hear my mom saying it in my ear right now, is that in order to know ourselves, we must know our past. We must honor and learn from our forebearers, and we must embrace and prepare for the impermanence of life. I wanna shift gears now and talk about the end of my mom's life and how her death was a part of her legacy. When my mom was diagnosed with a terminal glioblastoma brain tumor in the spring of 2019, we knew immediately that tending to her legacy was going to play a big part in her final months and moments. Strangely, my dad had also died of a glioblastoma brain tumor 23 years before. So we had a sense of what to expect as my mom's illness progressed. 
That experience, along with having had many conversations with her about illness and death and mortality over the years, allowed us to accept that my mom was not long for this world. For myself and my sister, our acceptance brought the opportunity for total and complete presence and to not fight her impending death. Accepting the reality of her mortality transformed our lives as she was dying and it opened up space for us to consider legacy almost immediately. Tending to her, tending to her legacy, it wasn't about envisioning a future without her, it was about forming a new relationship with her, one that would continue beyond her physical absence. One afternoon, as I visited my mom in the hospital with legacy in mind, I asked her what she needed to begin and to let go of this life, what felt unfinished. And she immediately replied that she wanted to see her poem, Seagull Games, illustrated as a children's book. My mom had written this poem over a decade ago as she sat on the porch of her seaside summer cottage. Though she didn't have any grandchildren at the time that she wrote the poem, she knew that the poetry that was flowing through her was intended for her grandkids. Years later, she set her poem to music and taught the song to her young grandchildren who would gleefully sing along, copying all of the different hand gestures that she had created to go along with the music. My mom was clear that she wanted her illustrated song to be a part of her legacy for her grandchildren who by the time of her diagnosis numbered in four. The youngest, little Luca, was born just three weeks after my mom's diagnosis. And we're thankful every day that he was born in time to meet his Nana. And a part of me really wonders if her drive to see her song illustrated as a book was so that Luca especially, the grandchild who would not have the opportunity to sing seagull games with his Nana, would have a piece of something special of hers to hold on to. So for anyone who has dabbled in self-publishing, you know that creating a book is no small feat. And we managed to do it in less than three months, thanks mostly to my mom's incredible and talented community of friends. We reached out to our family friend, Iris Moore. There she is. She is an award-winning artist and animator, and she was the perfect fit to illustrate my mom's poem because she was already a part of our grief journey. Much of Iris's work focuses on the themes of grief and death. And I had just shown her latest film, Why Must the Sun Go Down and The Evening Thread to my eldest daughter to help her understand her Nana's coming death. I highly recommend an evening thread. In this film, an old woman prepares to die. Accompanied by her granddaughter, she reflects on the memories of her life and on the profound experience of being human before taking the next step into the unknown. It's a beautiful meditation on death and legacy. And I also wanna mention why must the sun go down? It is a beautifully whimsical story to illustrate the cycle of life, one that I use often with my children and also recommend to uh, my client families who have young kids that are just starting to learn about that cycle of life. So Iris got to work on the illustrations and the one note that my mom gave her was that she wanted the seagulls to look like they were smiling. And within a few weeks, Iris presented my mom with the illustrations and she could not have been happier. During this time, we also reached out to another family friend, Madeline Humer, who was the director of the Victoria Children's Choir. We asked if she would help in completing the arrangement for the song. And then Madeline also offered to record her choir singing Seagull Games. This was amazing. I remember the day that we played this recording for my mom. It's gonna live in our hearts forever. By this time, my mom was already in hospice and I just remember the look on her face as she heard her song sung by this internationally renowned choir. And she said that it was one of the deepest honors of her life. 
So I'd like to play and show you Seagull Games now. And it's just gonna take me a moment to get it up on the screen for you. We were deeply honored to have Madeline and her choir perform Seagull Games at my mom's memorial service. By that time, Seagull Games had been published by a book and we were able to share this beautiful piece of legacy with the people who attended her service. So as you can see, there are incredible benefits of legacy to both the person who is dying and for their loved ones. For the dying, mindfully engaging in legacy making can help bring physical and emotional and spiritual comfort and reduce stress. It can also improve a sense of connection and social engagement with their loved ones. And there's a special piece of research here that talks about an increase in talkativeness through legacy making. There's something about this reminiscing and memory making that increases um, the person who is dying, their likelihood to talk and engage in conversation, which we know can sometimes slow down towards the end of life. So it brings a real gift of connection. Legacy can also enhance living while dying by making positive activities and interactions and memories and it can help the dying person prepare for death by knowing that they will be remembered. For loved ones, supporting legacy making can also enhance, enhance their comfort and decrease caregiver stress. And it can help them experience their anticipatory grief in a supported way. It can also improve communication with their loved one and create opportunities to make positive memories through the dying process. And finally, it can create something really beautiful and tang tangible to hold on to, something that can bring comfort through their loved one's end of life and beyond. For me, the greatest benefit of legacy making is the power it has to transform our relationship with death and the opportunity to refashion our relationship with the deceased. Legacy, it transcends death. It's not just about remembering the past, it's a tool to continue our bond with our loved one. Legacy allows us to see that love, connection, even presence persists and that maybe death isn't the end. I know that little Luca, who's now two and a half, he doesn't see death as the end. For him, legacy is a continuing bond. 
It's the beginning of his relationship with his Nana, one that is very real, where he talks about her and to her as if she were right there. And when you see him singing seagull games, who's to say that she's not? So I'd like to share this video of Luca singing seagull games with you. Face to the wind, they ride the gray rollers, a small white flotilla of hullabaloo. Frolicsome, frolicsome, up wave and down. They peek above in and out of my view, daring the breakers to swamp them completely. They wait. Wait. And with only a wing thrust or two, to a white water boat and a gull like uh, Yahoo! Uh, as their roller coaster riding delights them anew. Okay, he's objectively cute, right? <laughs> it just warms my heart every time I see him sing that song and do the little actions. Well, my mom, she certainly succeeded in her legacy making efforts. I see her success in the performances of the choir that she devoted 25 years of service to in her colleagues who say that they still use her one of a kind teaching tools. And I see it in the relationship that my sister and I have with death and the way that we honor our mom every day by telling her story and showing up in this world with love and curiosity. I also see her legacy in the way that she died. And in this death caring field as a death doula, we often talk about creating a good death or a fitting death, one that reflects our values and the way that we lived. And I'd like to tell you now a bit about my mom's death as a reflection of how she lived and also to illustrate the opportunities that Maid brought to live her legacy. So I want to start by telling you about how we told my daughter about her Nana's decision to have made. And I'm starting here because I know that panic that many adults feel when they think about having to talk with their children about death, let alone a medically assisted death. And certainly our greatest challenge was what do we tell the kids? At that time in the spring of 2019, there were no books. There were very few resources about how to talk with children about MAID. Fortunately, I received some really great information from the pediatric counselor at hospice, but really I felt like I was not as prepared as I wanted to be for this conversation. I'd had lots of experience talking with my kids about natural death, but I really had no idea about how to frame MAID and I didn't wanna cause any further harm to them. So one night I just took a deep breath and I spoke with my eldest daughter, who was seven years old at the time. She already knew that Nana was dying and she knew what cancer was. And so that night I told her that her Nana could wait for the cancer in her brain to make her so sick that it would cause her body to die. Or she could ask a doctor to help her die when she feels ready. And that Nana was choosing to ask a doctor to help her die and that it was going to be happening in five days. My daughter was honestly confused and quite incredulous. And she said, why does Nana want to die? She just couldn't understand this. And so I explained that the cancer was making Nana die and that Maid gave Nana a choice of when and how to die and that that choice brought her comfort. So my daughter and I talked for a long time that, that night with lots of silence as well. And then many times over the next few days. I knew that I'd done a good job when I heard from the mom of one of my daughter's best friends at school. So that day, apparently on the playground, my daughter had talked with her bestie about Nana's decision to have made. She'd explained to her friend that her Nana was dying of cancer and that Nana loved being with us, but that she wasn't afraid to die and she wasn't feeling very well. 
She said that Nana was sad that she couldn't do the things that she loved anymore, like go for walks in the forest and sing in her choir and make us pancakes. She said that Nana was sad to be leaving us, but that she wasn't afraid. And apparently uh, her best, best friend thought that this was totally reasonable. They agreed that Nana's maid was the right thing, given that she was already dying. And who really wants to live if you can't do the stuff that you love to do anymore? It was quite simple in their seven-year-old minds and hearts. So the success of my conversation with my daughter is really rooted in my mom's legacy. In the lessons I had learned from my mom about death, in the four bears picnic my children had experienced, and in the ways they already knew about their ancestors and the impermanence of life. These conversations with my daughter reflect one of my mom's most impactful legacy gifts, and that is normalizing talking about death and grief. So let's explore the day of my mom's death. I had slept over at her hospice room the night before, but before I left my house, I'd asked my daughters if there was anything they wanted me to say or bring to Nana as part of their final goodbye. And they didn't really have any ideas, but they really wanted something to do. So I suggested that uh, they offer Nana one of their teddy bears for comfort. And they loved that idea, scurried around and picked out the right teddy bear. And I presented it to my mom when I arrived at the hospice saying that it was a gift from the girls. And she immediately took it and tucked it right up under her chin and it stayed there all through that night and through her death the next day. My mom and I woke up early the next morning around 6 a.m. and I immediately went to her bedside and asked if she remembered what was happening that day because I was concerned that she wouldn't have the capacity to consent at the final moment. This was before the legislation change. But thankfully my mom just calmly said yes. My sister and three other family members arrived around 7.30. Uh, these were the people that my mom had chosen to be with her as she died. We all enjoyed breakfast together in her room, talking and laughing just like we would around her kitchen table at home. And around 8.30, the nurses came to give my mom a quick tidy up and to change her into a nightgown that they'd chosen especially for her. Around that time, a few chosen people began to arrive at the solarium in the hospice lounge. These were people my mom wanted nearby, but not actually with her when she died. These were also people that we thought needed a role to play and to have some engagement and extra support. And we asked the hospice spiritual advisor to sit with them and to hold space through that time. This was also when my eldest daughter and my husband arrived at the hospice grounds. The night before, we'd given my daughter a few choices about where she could be when her Nana died. And she chose to go get a smoothie and a croissant from the Tim Hortons uh, hospital restaurant, one of her favorite places, and to play in the gardens that surrounded the hospital chapel. She wanted to be close, but not too close to her Nana. And my other daughter that day was playing with her friends at daycare. At the same time, my mom's larger circle of friends were gathering at a friend's house close by. We'd invited a family friend who was also a counselor to hold space for about 10 people. They sat in circle, they shared their favorite memories of my mom. And at 9 a.m., the time the maid was going to start, they visualized my mom transitioning to her next form, gently, peacefully ushering her on her way. You can see that we took great care to find a role for everyone who needed one, offering different kinds of support, knowing that many people were invested in this day and in loving my mom. We recognized that my mom's life was lived in community, in deep relationship with her friends and her family, and so her death should be as well. The maid doctor arrived just before 9 a.m. And she spoke with my mom and then with those of us who would be witnessing, explaining the procedure. My mom had asked that for those of us that were attending with her, that we not say any 
any final words of I or offer last emotional declarations of love. Everything that needed to be said had been said. So I helped those of us who would be with my mom to ground ourselves and stabilize our energy and to become as present as possible. And then we accompanied my mom up to the rooftop garden where she had chosen to die. We settled into a sunny spot and a friend joined us to perform Reiki on my mom to help soothe and calm her. My sister and I sat on either side of her bed holding her hand. And when the Reiki was done, my mom opened her eyes and looked at each of us with love. And she cried for a moment. The doctor asked if she was ready to begin. And my mom said, yes. With one final look to the sky and a deep breath as if she was drinking in all of that beauty that surrounded her, my mom closed her eyes and within moments she was slipping away. My sister and I both envisioned our ancestors at the head of my mom's bed waiting to receive her. A sense of profound joy and even flooded through me at the prospect of this reunion. And I was happy for my mom. After a few minutes, the doctor confirmed that my mom had died. The volunteer coordinator, a woman we'd become good friends with during our time at hospice, joined us outside and stood at the head of my mom's bed and read Death, Death is Nothing at All by Henry Scott Holland. We spent some time quietly sitting with my mom's body and then my eldest daughter arrived. I'd asked her the day before if she would like to visit with Nana's body and without hesitation, she said, yes. I reminded her what to expect, how Nana's body would look and what it would feel like if we chose to touch it. And she sat on my lap next to her Nana's body, silent, looking for many minutes. I asked her if she would like to touch the body and she said no, but she seemed curious and she leaned in towards her Nana. And so I suggested that I would place my hand on Nana's arm and she could put her hand on top of mine. And so we did that for many minutes. Eventually she said she was ready to go. And I gave her a hug and walked her back to my husband and off she went to go play in a park as kids do. Others from the solarium came to sit with my mom's body and then her body was returned to her hospice room to await the funeral home. Later that afternoon, we all returned to my house for some sandwiches and some Prosecco, and together we created an altar. We invited everyone, including the kids, to pick an item that reminded them of Nana and to place it on the sideboard in the dining room. We added flowers and cards, photos and items. You can see my daughter there adding a flashlight trips with her Nana. This altar was a gathering point for our grief an external symbol of our love and sadness and a reminder to mourn together. This altar evolved over the next days, weeks, even months, and now years. A new item will occasionally appear put there by one of my kids as they feel moved to remember their Nana. And it offers beautiful insight into their grief and their healing. And I wanna share this picture. This was taken a week after my mom's death at her interment. And I invite you to look at our faces and sense the energy. For me, I'm still amazed at the deep sense of presence that we all felt. I really feel like it just emanates from this picture. And I wanna emphasize that my mom's illness and her death were incredibly difficult. Deep, deep sadness and grief bursts of emotions that I still feel and exhaustion that I'm recovering from even two years later. 
But that sadness comes from feeling her absence, not from the way that she died. And I don't believe that that is by chance. This is what's possible when you have a family that feels prepared, when a legacy bridge to their loved one has already been built, when you have access to safe quality end of life care, when you have consistent guidance from a death doula or from someone who has walked this path before, and when you also have the autonomy to decide when and how to die. And of course, a little bit of luck. Our knowing how to care for each other through this difficult time, it was only possible because of the lessons my mom had imparted, imparted to us while she was alive. And in our minds, her fitting death was the pinnacle of her legacy. My mom's legacy building didn't start with her terminal diagnosis. It started years before with her legacy writing, her family graveyard gatherings, and in her willingness to have sensitive conversations with kids. I remember uh, back in the 1980s, sitting around my kitchen table with my mom talking about Sue Rodriguez. This was when medically assisted death was pushed into the public consciousness through Sue's courageous activism and death. I know that talking about assisted death with a 12 year old might seem like an unusual parenting choice, but that was my mom. She always held us as capable of conversation and of forming our own opinion. And she made it safe to have conversations about complicated and emotional topics. In fact, my mom had conversations about maid, death, legacy, mortality, and other complex and sensitive topics with just about everyone in her life. So when the time came for her death, when she decided to choose MAID, we were as ready as we could be, or at least we understood why my mom was choosing MAID, why it was the right choice for her. And really, can you imagine any better legacy for your loved ones than the gift of your mindful death? So I ask, what does legacy mean to you now that we've reframed it. As you consider this question, I invite you to consider how your dying might be a part of your legacy and how your death will reflect your values, how you lived your life and the comfort that you wanna to bring to your loved ones. And I ask you to think about how you can start living your legacy right now. To help with this, I wanna share a few resources. So the first is Willow, Life, Willow End of Life Education and Resources. So they have an incredible suite of workbooks and workshops to help ground you in your values and to help you make sense of life and death. My favorite of their resources is their five minute legacy love letter and also a tool around how to write your heart will. These tools are perfect for capturing your legacy and the messages you want to leave for your loved ones. And they're also available as free downloads on their website. I want to mention um, that there is a, a Legacy Love Letter workshop coming up with Death Doula Network BC on November 11th. So there's still time to register. So they are certified um, Willow educators, and I highly recommend their workshops with uh, Karen and Joanne. They are always fun and supportive and a really lovely creative space to safely explore your life and death. I'm just gonna pop the registration link here into chat for you. Okay, hopefully that link works. You can always Google them as well. I also want to mention a book that I've just come across and I've just ordered it and it's called Legacies of the Heart by Meg Newhouse and it has some really beautiful examples really tangible concrete ideas for how you can start enacting your legacy right now. So I also want to stay connected and let you know that I have many resources on my website to help with end of life planning and um, navigating the end of life journey, including my flagship resource, my personal comfort plan. So this is a guide and a checklist to help people find physical, emotional, and spiritual comfort through illness and their end of life. 
You can also sign up for my newsletter on my website uh, and learn more about how death doulas can help during this time. Just a quick note, I'm not producing uh, a lot of uh, newsletters or web content at this time because I've just started um, an MA in clinical counseling. Um, and so that's taking a lot of my focus right now, but my aim is to create a private practice that will support children's and grief, uh, children's grief and their bereavement. So you can reach me at circlespace.ca if you'd like to stay in touch. And finally, I just want to thank you for allowing me to share my mom's story, and I hope that you've been inspired by it. And I'd like to close with a poem by her favorite poet, John O'Donohue, in hopes that it will offer you encouragement to start living your legacy right now. So this is called For Death, From To Bless The Space Between Us, A Book of Blessings. From the moment you were born, your death has walked beside you. Though it seldom shows its face, you still feel its empty touch where fear invades your life, or what you lost, love is lost, or inner damage is incurred. Yet when destiny draws you into these spaces of poverty, and your heart stays generous until some door opens into the light, you are quietly befriending your death so that you will have no need to fear when your time comes to turn and leave. That the silent presence of your death would call your life to attention, wake you up to how scarce your time is and to the urgency to become free and equal to the call of your destiny. That you would gather yourself and decide carefully how you can live the life you would love to look back on from your deathbed. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was incredibly beautiful and emotional and just the way that your mom lived her whole life so creatively is so clearly shown through her life and then in her death. And I feel like that is just so beautiful and I'm really truly grateful for you sharing this with us. We have so many amazing comments that have come in. Can't even read all of them. There are so many, but we'll get them to you for sure. A few of them say, your mom was so creative, bless her soul. What a lovely story about your two-year-old's journey to the family grave and your mother sounds like a wonderful soul. Just a note to say how greatly I appreciate sharing your story of your mom's legacy with us. It must be incredibly emotional. The song's so beautiful and the illustrations are amazing. Thank you for sharing this beautiful piece of your mother. She had an amazing soul. Illustrations are beautiful. The seagulls are definitely smiling. <laughs> um, and so many more thanks and gratitude um, for your sharing all of this. Um, really, really so special. So thank you. thank you. And so we do also have a few questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, where should we start? Um, so actually first, a few folks were wondering if um, there's anywhere where they can get a copy of the song, um, even uh, the sheet music or the uh, poems, illustrations, if you have that available. Yes, of Seagull Games. We've been slowly working on um, figuring out how to get it into our local bookstores. And we do have plans to get it up on Amazon at some point or some kind of online bookseller. But the wheels are turning slowly with that. Um, so what I might do after conversation with my family is actually put it up on my, my website um, as one of the resources there. So uh, just check back at circlespace.ca over the coming weeks to see. Thank you so much for your interest. Yeah, a few people were asking that. So um, that's great news that um, that'll be hopefully in the future. Um, so another question is, do you know of any resources for children um, specifically who have a loved one going through the MAID process? Mm -hmm. That's still a challenging question. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, Canadian Virtual Hospice has just released a whole suite of resources around MAID. And my understanding is that there are some coming, if not already released, for children. I think 
older children. Um, but really this is an area that is still significantly lacking for, for kids. Um, when I was having these conversations with my children, uh, you know, there were some really great online articles with some good information. Um, there's some uh, web videos at Canadian Virtual Hospice that kind of role model how that conversation might go, all intended for adults to look at them and then share it with their kids. And one of the things that I really wanted was a resource that I could use with my kids, something to engage them, something that was child friendly. And so I went to my library like I do, like, you know, if my kids have to go to the dentist, you go get, go get a book about going to the dentist or, you know, they break their arm, you get a book about getting a cast made or strangers and all of that. Went to my library to try and find something around MAID and there was not a single children's book about MAID. And so a few months after my mom uh, died, I sat down and this book that I call Pancakes with Nana just flowed through me in the same way that Seagull Games I think did for my mom. And so um, I, I have drafted a children's book, uh, a manuscript, two now, in fact, one for older children and one for kids that are around four or five to help explain made in a child-friendly way that really um, role models ways that we can engage children and meet them where they're at and help them be a part of the made process through ritual and belonging and empathy. Um, and so it's been a long journey getting these books done. I'm about to go into another round of edits and, and I'm hoping that a publisher will want to pick it up. But if not, um, I'll be looking for support to self-publish because I, I know that there's many, many families out there and hospice counselors and people that need this kind of resource for their children. Yeah, that is so incredibly important. and. Even, you know, like your daughter's friend, for example, who wasn't having someone directly um, in her own family or her own life in that way going through MAID, it would still be amazing to have that resource to sort of share amongst friends and to sort of know maybe what your friend is perhaps going through, ways that you can kind of um, be together in that process. So, so I know, you know, so many of our supporters are going to be so excited to um, buy a copy of your book, including myself. So um, I'm really glad that you're, you're doing that. Thank you. Um, okay, here. Um, so someone's asking um, about death doulas. What do they do? Um, what type of work, um, you know, is common for someone who is a death doula? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so death doulas are um, like a non-clinical, non-medical um, end of life support role. So we offer emotional and physical and spiritual comfort. Um, and really, you know, death doulas are available for help at any time in your life. Um, a lot of death doulas support advanced care planning and you know, helping to get your affairs in order and to really explore that reality of your mortality, offering a safe and constructive space to look at, you know, your values and your fears and your hopes and wishes around life and death. And then certainly when a family is experiencing a terminal diagnosis or they're nearing end of life, a death doula can offer a number of different supports. And what's so fabulous about death doulas is that each one is different. They bring a different skill set um, to that role. So for me, in my practice, what I specialize in is uh, one, <clears throat> excuse me, system navigation. So we know that when you're ill and when your family is so focused on caring for you, you're suddenly having to adapt and learn this new environment, all these different you know, medical systems, the legal system for your will, um, home care, and it can be really overwhelming and to slip through the cracks or not know what benefits and supports are available. And so my role is to really help people weave like a, a seamless circle of support uh, around themselves and their loved ones during that time. Death doulas can help facilitate legacy making, help with that reflection and writing. Um, and we can also help to support family caregivers in their roles, understand how to engage children, and then also with vigiling and comfort measures through the active dying process, and then support afterwards um, through preparing uh, plans for your service or ceremony or final disposition. 
Um, there's lots of different incredible roles. Yeah, that's, it's so, um, it's such a special person to have, you know, be alongside others, just someone who's removed, but also really personally involved to be that kind of grounding presence when things may feel, um, you know, not so grounded necessarily. Um, someone else asked, I'm wondering if you found it difficult um, to be both a daughter and a doula at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. That I've reflected on that since then. Um, and I am just so deeply, deeply grateful that I had these death caring skills before my mom got sick. Um, and I, at the time I tried to delegate certain roles. Like I did bring in a friend who, you know, was starting work as a doula to help have some conversations. Um, but for me, I really felt that being a doula and a daughter was the only way that I could have that experience with my mom, um, that it was something that I needed to do. Um, and I'm just so deeply grateful that I was there to be able to support my family. And I feel like having a doula, both myself and then also the resources that I had through my death caring community really helped make this fitting death possible and help to soften and ease the grief that we're still managing, you know, two and a half years later. Um, it really is a skill and a knowledge that's ancient that we've lost over time. And so if we don't innately have it within our, within our uh, family, this is where bringing in an outside doula to help um, remind you of those skills that we have and to help with the education piece and to take some of that burden off of your plate. Uh, is just so powerful. Yes, absolutely. Um, what was the reaction of your immediate community knowing of your mother's choice and especially for your children's um, sort of circle of friends and community? Mm -hmm. We were very fortunate that everyone responded with support and understanding. Uh, and there's a couple of factors that supported that one, the amount of work that my mom had done through her life in communicating what her values are and surrounding herself with people who were compassionate and understanding, even if they would not choose made for themselves. Um, we had a community of people around us who respected that that choice. Um, and my kids, you know, like they don't they didn't know any different right so because I normalized it and my family normalized it, it was no different than, you know, how we would have presented a natural death or not an assisted death. Uh, and this is the power that we have in shaping our family culture, especially with kids. They don't have the same sense of stigma that a lot of adults do. So if we're okay with it, then they're gonna be okay with it. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, so I guess on that note, this is sort of in a similar vein. Um, how would you know if a child is ready for a made conversation? This kind of, you know, can this kind of talk be really challenging or traumatic for a child as well? What the comments said. Absolutely. And, and the, the thing I always like to say is that like, you know, your kids best, you are talking with them in the context of your own family culture. And so that's the first thing to think about. Um, but, you know, when we're talking, Talking about in particular, there's some foundational pieces that kids need to know. So the younger the kid is, um, you know, the less the less able they are because of their brain development and their social emotional development, the less able they are to understand like the permanence of death. And so there's some foundational pieces, it's some education that you need to do first that comes before the made conversation. So talking about <clears throat> like, <clears throat> excuse me, naming the particular illness that the person has and describing what that is in child-friendly language, how that affects their body. Also um, establishing that they really understand what death is. So what happens to the body when you die <clears throat> and understanding that you know your body uh, and your head stops working, your heart stops beating, your lungs, you can't see, taste, you don't eat, you don't play. Um, and that your body doesn't start working again. So establishing some foundational stuff around the permanence of death. So once you've done that, then talking about MADE, um, 
you know, if we, if the family culture is that it's on par with a natural death, there's no different. It's just one way of dying, right? The illness is what's causing the person to die. The made is the choice about um, how and when. And so, you know, using some of the language that I shared in my presentation, what it's going to be my children's book, what's on Canadian virtual hospice, um, talking about made in a very fact-based way uh, is, is a, a really solid approach for, for talking with children. And then you can kind of get into the more philosophical stuff, like let them, their questions guide you for what they want to know and what to introduce next. Yeah, and you know, that having those conversations about death and dying as a foundation is such an important point um, because, you know, even as adults, it, people can be so resistant and understandably why talking about death can feel really challenging or hard to know how to approach it. So um, I think that point about having that baseline um, is, is crucial. So yeah, thank you. So we have time for just one more question. Um, I know there are so many questions that have come in. Um, all right, let's see. So this one question is asking, um, what do you do with someone who is perhaps um, resistant to the idea of a legacy um, or isn't necessarily creative um, in that kind of capacity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, people get caught up on what like these traditional definitions of legacy is. Like it feels very, um, over, it can feel really overwhelming to be like, well, what are, what are my biggest life lessons that I want to impart? Like that can seem like, how do I summarize my entire life? But I think, you know, starting really small is, is key. And so this is where those willow end of life tools are so fantastic. So within, um, I think it's either the heart will or the five minute legacy letter, there's a series of questions of prompts that, um, you know, you can explore over a cup of tea, like, you know, don't get the pen and paper out right away, but just have a conversation. Um, start talking about what were your favorite books? You know, what, what music were you listening to um, when you had your first kiss? Like, just little sweet, think about little sweet moments in life and start there, um, you know, almost like you're kind of, you know, interviewing yourself or interviewing someone, but doing it through conversation um, where you're curious about your life and the meaning that you make of it um, and not slapping big labels like I'm making my legacy on it um, can be a gentle entry point. Yeah, that is, that feels very accessible. Um, for people who perhaps feel overwhelmed by creativity or, you know, an artistic expression, whatever that looks like um, for people. So I love that just combination. And when you had ta talked as well about ancestral um, connection or relationship as part of legacy, um, that's also something I think as well that isn't sort of typically creative in that way, but it is in, um, in different ways that the word exists. So Again, thank you so, so much. Um, I know personally, I have a lot to think about and I feel really inspired with um, all the ideas that you've shared and just um, all the personal experiences as well. So yeah, thank you so, so, so much for this. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Sure. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we've left the link in the comments, um, in the chat. Uh, for the next sessions for the conference, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much.